Hey, good morning, super readers. This is Mr. Massimino. I'm back to read a little bit more of our book, Seed Folks. It's our realistic fiction story that uh, we began last week. Um, to be honest with you, I've tried to read this chapter and upload it three times. So we'll try again, and hopefully the fourth time will be our lucky charm. So let's find out. Uh, last chapter, we read about a little girl named Kim who was planting some seeds into a vacant or empty, kind of junky, ran-down lot in her neighborhood. Um, and today, we're going to uh, read about Anna, another community member. Um, as I look for clues to the story, uh, I see a picture of who Anna might be. It tells me that she's a older woman, maybe had some experiences in her life. And um, I see what is binoculars, things that help you uh, look at objects that are really far away. So let's get started. Anna. I do love to sit and look out the window. Why do I need TV when I have 48 apartment windows to watch across the vacant lot and a sliver of Lake Erie? I've seen history out this window so much. I was four when we moved here in 1919. The fruit sellers carts and coal wagons were pulled down the street by horses back then. I used to stand just here and watch the coal brought up by the handsome lad from Groza, the village my parents were born in. Gibbs Street was mainly Romanians back then. It was Adio, goodbye in all the shops when you left. Then the Romanians started leaving. They weren't the first or the last. This has always been a working class neighborhood. It's like a cheap hotel. You stay until you've got enough money to leave. A lot of Slovaks and Italians moved in next. Then Negro families in the depression. Gibb Street became the line between the blacks and the whites, like a border between countries. I watched it happen through this very window. So I'm just stopping. I'm thinking about the story. Uh, Anna, she moved to this community or neighborhood a hundred years ago, and she stayed within this community, and she's seen people of all different cultures move into the buildings and live there and move out. I lived over in Cleveland Heights for 18 years. Then I moved back in to take care of my parents. That border moved too. Most all the whites left. Then the steel mills and factories closed and everybody left like rats. Buildings just abandoned. Men with no work, drinking from nine to five, instead, down there in the lot. Always the sirens, people killing each other. Now I see families from Mexico and Cambodia and countries I don't know. Twelve people sometimes in one apartment. New languages in the shops and on the streets. These new people leave when they can, like the others. I'm the only one staying. It's so, staying and staring at the same window. This spring, I looked out and I saw something strange. Down in the lot, a little black-haired girl hiding behind that refrigerator. She was working at the dirt and looking around suspiciously all the time. Then I realized she was burying something. I never had children of my own, but I've seen enough. But I've seen enough in that lot to know she was mixed up and something she shouldn't be. And after 20 years typing for the parole department, I just about knew what she'd buried. Drugs, most likely, or money, or a gun. The next moment, she disappeared like a rabbit. I thought of calling up the police. Then I saw her there the next morning and I decided I'm gonna solve this case myself. 
We had a long spell of rain then. I didn't set eyes on her once. Then the weather turned warm, and I saw her twice more. Always in the morning, on her way to school. She was crouched down with her back to me, so I couldn't see just what she was doing. My curiosity was like a fever inside me. Then, one morning, she was there, glancing about, that means looking quickly, and she looked straight up at my window. I pulled my head back, behind the curtain. I wasn't sure if she'd seen me. If she had, she wouldn't leave the treasure buried long. Then I knew I'd have to dig it up before she did. I waited an hour after she left, and then I took an old butter knife and my cane, and I hobbled down all three flights of stairs. I worked my way through the awful jungle and junk and finally came to her spot. I stooped down. It was wet there and easy digging. I hacked and I dug, but didn't find anything except for a large white bean. I tried a new spot, and I found another. Then a third. Then the truth. <sighs> then the truth. It was like a slap in the face. I said to myself, what have you done? Two beans had roots. I knew I'd done them harm. I felt like I'd read through her secret diary and had ripped out a page without meaning to. I laid those beans. I laid those beans right back in the ground as gently as sleeping babies. Then I patted the soil as smooth as could be. The next morning, she was back. I peeked around the curtain. She didn't look up here or give any sign that she noticed something was wrong. I could see her clearly this time. She reached a hand into her school bag. Then she pulled out a jar, unscrewed the lid, and poured out water onto the ground. That afternoon, I bought some binoculars. So that was chapter two where we were introduced to our next character or another community member, um, Anna. So I look forward to continuing this story with you. See you soon.